Hey, what's going on? It's Bill Burr, and it's time for the Monday Morning Podcast for June 1st, 2020. Oh, Jesus. The summer's here, and I just feel like if a bunch of people can get together and throw bricks through the windows of a Target, I can go to the beach, okay? Because if I can't do that, isn't that like a double standard? Oh, big shout out to anybody who actually could sit there and watch the news over the last week and continue to watch the news and do all of that. I don't know why you would do that to yourself. It's going to give you a horrible um, idea of humanity and what people are like. Um, I would venture to say that 99.9% of the population is not rioting, is not pulling people over and then, you know, beating them up, uh, murdering them, or whatever, okay? But if you want to sit there and watch the news and get all fucking bummed out about that shit, I mean, that is is your prerogative, and I salute you for wanting to be that informed. Um, However, I I do understand that uh, there's always going to be mouth breathers, and there's always going to be, you know, misdirected anger, there's going to be a bunch of stuff, but You got to keep your eye on the ball on this thing, okay? You know, I I just think that there needs to be... The reality is, is if we ever want to solve this, everyone would have to get involved and everyone would have to give a shit. And I think it would go beyond, you know, just tweeting Black Lives Matter. And there I did my part. Like, you'd really have to, like... there's, There's no reason to to... Just be still doing this to each other. There's no fucking reason for it. There just isn't. There's no reason for it. And, uh, I, I, you know, I don't know. I just don't understand how somebody can be face down with handcuffs, even though it appears there was some sort of altercation in the back of the, of the cruiser. There was some sort of resisting arrest. You know you shouldn't do that. They already got you. You are handcuffed or whatever. But, like, at some point when you're face down, And, you know, handcuffed saying, I can't breathe. I just don't understand. And I'm ignorant of the whole process. I don't understand why you can't just ease up your knee, maybe move your knee off of the neck. You could still be, I mean, I don't know what sort of human being with their arms behind their back can do, you know. Was he worried that the guy was going to start doing the worm and fucking flip him off and then, I don't know, break his handcuffs? I don't know what deal was, but when somebody says they can't breathe and, uh, the unprecedented amount of leaders that are uh, just saying insightful things is just unbelievable. Like, uh, hey, if you can say I can't breathe, that means you can breathe. And it's just like, buddy, if that was your daughter or your son or you, would you really have that same perspective? You know what I mean? There's different levels of not being able to breathe. It's not getting a full breath. Okay, that would be like if a fucking python grabbed you and started to squeeze you and you're like, dude, help me out. Help me out. Well, you know, if you can still talk at this point, obviously you could still breathe. I mean, it's (laughs) so um, and even though that dude was from Mississippi, I'm not judging everybody down there in Mississippi. I'm sure there's plenty of people that can kind of see this thing. So hopefully, um, you know, I think the curfews are a great thing that'll stop the mouth breathing morons from uh, attacking small businesses for whatever fucking reason. You know, I, I we would think if there was some sort of like through line to the outrage, you would go after major corporations rather than mom and pop stores. Uh, I don't know why people would do that. But anyway, and then the white people also looting going down there like it's spring break, like, hey, let's fucking act like we're oppressed See what this feels like. <laughs> um, I don't understand that either. And, and it's all just uh, the whole thing is fucking weird. But the, the, it's the still the focus is that there. And it was so great to see so many police officers saying that 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 situation in Minneapolis was not handled correctly. That is unprecedented. You know, there's always been everybody just the cops always just stayed with each other. And, and it's time like to. Uh, correct that problem. And I think it's time to hear from both sides because also being a cop 
every night you could get killed and you're going up to a vehicle. You have no fucking idea what the person is going to do. You can't see their fucking hands. You don't know what's going on and who wants to die. Nobody. I mean, it's a it's an incredibly difficult job, I would think. So I think there needs to be some empathy. You need to listen. And uh, all of these people, you know, who are just fanning the flames. I, I just don't understand unless you enjoy it. You just fucking have hate in your heart or something. I don't understand what this is. And, um, you know, I don't know. I don't know. But I, I would not judge people by these idiots at night doing what they're doing. I understand some of the rage and that type of stuff. But I just go into somebody's mom and pop store and just fucking burning it down and taking all their shit. Like, uh, I don't know. That just seems like that's just sort of a. That's not a smart move. All right, there. I said it. Okay, I, I said my little fucking piece. What do I? And you know what I'm gonna do now? I'm gonna get back to my fucking job, which is trying to make people laugh during all of this fucking chaos. Hey, Betty. Hey, it's the summertime, everybody. When you're running down the street with the microwave, you know, as much as you shouldn't do that, you know, you're technically also working on your beach body. All right. And God damn it, the fucking beaches are open. The uh, restaurants are open. I actually ate at a restaurant last night. Um, I was taking my wife for a drive. Um, and uh, there was this burger place we always wanted to go to. So we called up, ordered, went to pick up. We went in and there was people sitting like every three booths away from each other. And I was like, you know, it's a burger, it's fries, a root beer. It's going to be messy to eat in the car. I said, can we go over there and sit there? And they're like, yeah. So we did that. I don't know if that was the right thing or the wrong thing to do, but I feel pretty good today. I can tell you that. Um, and I've just been driving around Los Angeles, um, really learning about the city on these drives, like just kind of getting to something you usually can't do in LA, which is cruise around because there's always, there's so much traffic out here. And, um, I've learned about fucking bike paths and, 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 the street in Van Nuys where people still, I guess, Wednesday nights, whatever, they still cruise up and down where they shot like American Graffiti. Had no idea about that. Um, restaurants, architecture, all these different little subsets of city, out, cities outside of L.A., beautiful views. And, um, you know, just being in the entertainment business, for some reason, it's always been all about getting into like Beverly Hills, the Pacific Palisades, like everybody wants that same view, you know, unobstructed downtown L.A. all the way out to the ocean. That's that's the then then I'll be happy. (laughs) Um, But there are so many more views to have in this city that are just as breathtaking. um, For like a third of the price. And with people probably who aren't in the entertainment business, so it'd be cool to live out there and just fucking get away from it and shit. So I've really enjoyed doing that. And L.A., you know, gets a really bad rap as far as like plastic people and fucking smog and all this shit. It has some of the most beautiful houses and architecture of any city I've ever been in. And the views, if you can just get yourself a little ways up in a hill and look over a couple houses, it looks like Christmas every night. It's fucking amazing. So, um I don't know what happened. I somehow really, uh, over the years, have uh, I love this city the way I love like East Coast cities now and all the food and that type of stuff. And I'm really missing, uh, you know, food trucks and all of that type of shit. But it seems like we're starting to turn the corner on all of this stuff. So that's a good thing. And um, I think uh, with all of this stuff that's going on, all the other stuff, the George Floyd stuff, I think the best way to go about it, you should, rather than tweeting shit, I think you literally have to, like, do what what feminists did. They knew if we just bitch, no one's going to give a fuck, we have to go after the money. So they would go after the advertisers if there was somebody that they wanted to, you know, silence or make apologize or whatever. For better or worse, sometimes they were right, sometimes they abused their power, but it seems like that's the way to go, that you would talk to politicians and, and people like that. Um, but I don't know. I actually have a positive feeling about this. I feel like this is going to be a tipping point. The fact that you saw police officers walking 
with protesters and, and police officers speaking out against it, saying that's not good police work, you shouldn't do it that way, I think is a major, major step that I have not seen in the past. So actually, as ugly as all of this is and depressing, I think it's, it's, gonna, be, it's gonna be a positive thing. So there you go, look at that. Now, let's get, let's get to something not positive. Let's talk about the presidential election coming up. Uh, Biden versus Trump, or as I like to call it, the dud versus the dope. <laughs> Democrats, are you trying to lose the election? Once again, boxing out Bernie Sanders is in 100% full effect. I mean, that is the fight you want to see. This is like when you want to see Pacquiao Mayweather, but fucking Mayweather keeps fighting all, all these other fucking guys. You know, instead, I, I don't understand it, like... Bernie is the Democrat version of Trump. He is a rebel. He is outside the lines. All right. You got to fight fire with fire. You, you, they're going to bring another company man in like they did with Hillary. It's a fucking mistake. Um, but Jesus Christ, I, I, you know, I try to stay out of the politics shit. I really do. Like Mike Pence doesn't bug me. It's, just, you know, but watching a guy fanning the fucking flames and talking about shooting American citizens with the National Guard, like that guy is just like, he does not, he can't be that dumb. He just doesn't, he just, they, you turn on a microphone, he's just going to start talking. Like if this guy was in the fucking mob, like he would, he, I don't even think, he wouldn't even get whacked because he wouldn't even ascend to any sort of level. You know, Donnie the Mouth. <laughs> Don't eat dumb, dumb. I don't know what the fuck they would call him, but there's no fucking way they would put that guy in charge of anything. If at some point they would, I think they would just stop returning his calls. Um, anyway, and, and then like, I don't understand uh, uh, Joe Biden. Joe Biden is like, you know, I don't know. Listening to that guy fucking give his speech is like, I feel like I'm at community service, you know? I would rather go pick up litter on the side of the highway. I would actually enjoy that, knowing that I was making the city cleaner. Not the earth, by the way. You make the city cleaner. That whole fucking bullshit. Put litter in its place where the animals live. (laughs) Where we can't see it. It still fucking exists. However, you know, I would enjoy doing that more so than uh, listen to that guy give a fucking speech. Jesus Christ. Oh, I'm going to sneeze in a bad way. (laughs) Jesus Christ. Oh, fuck. I ate at a restaurant last night. I have it. Um, anyway. Um, yeah, I'm trying to avoid all this shit that I watched. I watched a real sports with Brian Gumble about, uh, you know, the COVID tests and how they, they weren't giving them out to people who were doctors and nurses and stuff like this. And this poor woman got exposed to it and she exposed her sister to it and her sister died. It's one of the worst fucking things I've ever seen. Um, I just, here's a question I have for you guys. Why, when there's a decision on the table, choosing more money or choosing the right thing, why is it never the same? It's always a fork in the road. Why is more money always worse Morally, you know, I don't know. I've been fascinated with the whole human fucking behavior, looking at it, knowing that I'm also human. So I'm not judging people, but, and I've been guilty of this. I really think that human beings at the end of the day, one of our major flaws is we would rather win than be right. You know, I find myself so many times arguing with my wife about fucking, you know, and she gives me, you know, some sort of feminist rhetoric and I'll actually know she's right. And just because She's saying it about guys and I'm a guy. I just will fucking argue it. And it takes me like two or three days to be like, all right, you know what? You were right. She's like, why the fuck you need to just say that? Because I'm a fucking human being. All right? The same way you can't, you can't admit that you're a little uh, messy. You know? Oh, my wife loves a corner of a room. Woo! She will fucking throw some shit in the corner of a room. Just a bunch of, it drives me up the fucking wall. Not a big fan of the clutter. Um... That's a good name for a band, The Clutter, you know? Then if people shit on your album, well, I mean, you, you heard the name of the band. Why the fuck would you listen to it? <laughs> <laughs> it's 
So um, anyway, I went on a, I uh, did something real dangerous yesterday. I actually went on a little bike ride here in LA. I just figured it was Sunday morning. I could get away with it. And uh, I forgot my mask. I was such a cunt yesterday. I forgot my mask and I already like had gone down a few hills. I'm like, I'm not going all the way back. So I just sort of rode away from people and shit like that. But like, I still don't like riding out in the street, you know, God knows there's no bike lanes out here, you know, just cause they paint a bicycle in the middle of the street, you know? Um, and just the way some people ride bicycles, that fucking thing where you're riding down the street and you and somebody else are riding and you ride next to the person blocking the whole fucking street. So nobody can pass as you guys sit there shooting the shit. Um, there's two types of people that ride bicycles. There's the people that just wear regular clothes, and I find them to be courteous. And then there's the people who dress like they're in the Tour de France and act like it's a fucking bike race. And they're the biggest cunts on the planet. And they, they blow through stop signs. Like, that was what I did y- yesterday. I made sure that I stopped at every fucking stop sign. Now, by stop is I mean I rode as slowly as humanly possible before I could then continue. It was a, sort of a rolling stop. You know what I mean? But I did stop. I didn't just do that thing where you stand up on your pedals and you look left and right and blow through a fucking red light. And then you get hit and then they frost your bicycle like something tragic happened. Um, not saying every person that died on a bicycle was not hit tragically because somebody was texting. Not saying that either. But I realized I'm too old to ride a bicycle that's like uh, a 10 or 12 speed design with those handles. Because the, you, you, the way you're positioned and then you have to have your head up fucking hurts my neck. So I need to go more of like the, the beach rambler, uh, beach fucking, what do you call those things? Mountain bike thing. You know, mountain bike style while not being on a mountain, whatever you call that. I think you call that white guy over 50 bicycle. Cycling, is that what it's called? Is that what people talk about? Um, my shoulder rehab, people, if you're rehabbing a rotator cuff, um, I finally learned that you have to go excruciatingly slow, even though that information was conveyed to me immediately. It's taken me all these years and I am up to, I'm, I'm using the pink weight, one pounder. I did, uh, two sets of 10 and the last one I did 11 and I didn't even have to ice it. No anti-inflammatory, nothing. It's felt great the last two days. So tomorrow is, is another rehab day. Every three days I do it. I do these exercises and I'm, this time I'm going to, I'm going to try to go three sets of 11. You know, the old me be like, Hey, let's go up to fucking 12 or 13 for three sets. And that's just enough to twinge the fucking thing. So, um, if I can just get this fucking thing up, once I get up, I know I keep saying this, but I'm saying it f- for me so I can get past this shit. Once you get up to like four or five pounds doing the exercises that I'm doing, then you can increase weight without having to worry. But that going from one pound to two pounds, I told you my deal. I'm going to get all the way up to three sets of 20. So 60 reps, 60 pounds. And then when I switch to a two pounder, I'm going to do uh, the one pounder two sets of maybe 15 each. And then the third set is going to be with the two pounder. And I'm only going to do three reps and see how that feels. And then I will gradually increase it up to where I can do one full set with the two pounder. And the first two sets are still going to be with the one pound and plus the warm up, and just gradually increase that and just gauge it on how, you know, how much my shoulder's talking to me to, to, move forward, back off, or stay where I'm at. And I don't know why I didn't do that before, but probably because I was traveling and all of that shit. But um, I talked to my agent yesterday about possibly setting up some shows. Um, There's a particular venue out here that is, uh, you know, struggling or whatever. So I was thinking of doing like a little run of shows there, you know, and let, you know, just... Uh, you know, I won't charge him anything. You know, people pay some money for the tickets. They buy some alcohol, have a good fucking time. That guy makes his money. I don't need to do shit. All I need to do is just go up there and shake the rust off and all of that type of stuff. I think it could be, uh, I think it'd be a good thing for everybody. Um, so hopefully I can put that together sooner rather than later. Sorry. Got the hiccups. Um, all right, let's talk about some shit here that happened in my life. So I went out to my little podcast studio slash drum studio slash 
garage. And um, I open the side door, okay? I have a nice little carpet down and all of that shit, right? And I come walking in, and there's a little gecko. Somehow it's got in through the side door, which I don't know. They can really fucking flatten out their bodies. I don't know what their deal is. So I'm like, Jesus Christ. So I go to, like, you know, give it a little flip, you know, up and over the threshold to get it out of there. But I didn't want to hurt him, but I, I also needed to get him out of there. So I sort of, no pun intended with the reptile reference here, I sort of alligator armed it with my foot, and I missed him. And God bless him, he fucking, D took off. And he was on a hardwood floor before he got to the carpet. And that was my last window to try and get this fucker. And then once he got to the carpet, he went underneath my, my, my suitcase and by the time I zoomed the wheels, you know, pushed it out of the way, he was underneath the couch. And the couch sits real low, like a fucking low rider, right? Sort of couch, you know, not high legs or anything. So I put the flashlight, my phone, I now have a phone again. And I saw the little fucker underneath there, right? So I had this old Rolling Stone one, the one that Adam Yock was on the cover when he died, right? And, uh... I'm trying to fucking push him out, and I just couldn't get him. And then I just decided, like, you know what? There's nothing to eat in here. There's nothing to fuck in here. This thing's eventually going to leave on its own power, and I just said, fuck it. Now, the old me, I also didn't want to pick up the sofa and fuck up my shoulder. So I was just like, you know what? Fuck it. You want to stay in here and fucking be a lizard? I don't give a shit. So I now share my studio with this little fucking lizard, right? I had a real weird weekend, you know? My wife's going through it. Like, we're literally down to single digits here as far as when the baby's coming, as far as days left. And um, so I, I wanted to make her something sweet, right? So I was out at the grocery store, and uh, I knew I was going to make her a cake or some cupcakes for her birthday. So I got some of that, that dark chocolate, that shit, that cooking chocolate or whatever, and they had this recipe for uh, these peanut butter cheesecake brownies. So all right, I'll make those fucking things for her this weekend, right? So I go downstairs. She doesn't know I'm doing it. And I'm fucking making this shit. And for whatever reason, they said to put like, you know, tin foil in the uh, the casserole dish type of thing and spray it. So then you can like the tin foil, you lift it up and out when you're done and the whole thing comes out. It's actually kind of slick, I guess, right? So um, anyway, I uh, but I didn't have good tin foil. It was that cheap shit. You know, there's like Reynolds wrap and then there's these other shit where if you would like to like the, the littlest amount of pressure, you accidentally tear the fucking thing in half. Um, so anyway, I make these fucking things and I'm tasting along the way. I'm like, oh man, it's going to taste delicious, right? And I, and I cook these fucking things. I don't know what happened. I cut out a square and I ate it and immediately. It was the worst fucking tasting thing I'd ever tasted in my life. You know what? It, it reminded me of a long time ago. I had season tickets to the Pats in 1989, right? I always tell you that, but I did, right? And we were all shit-faced, and we thought we had the grill going, so we put our food on it, our burgers and stuff, and then the fire went out. We had to get it going again, and we were so hammered. We were shooting lighter fluid under the charcoals, but it was also getting onto the burgers. And when I ate the burger, it was just like I could taste the lighter fluid in it, but I was so fucking hammered and hungry, I ate it anyways, and like the fucking hangover I got was brutal. So I was eating this this peanut butter cheesecake brownie and I was having a flashback to that like why does it taste like there's like chemicals in it this is fucking terrible and I was done eating it you know I came upstairs I told my wife I said I blew it man they don't eat them they're terrible I'm gonna throw them out tomorrow morning and the next day I went downstairs and I went to throw them out and I looked at the space where the brownie was and there was a little triangle piece of fucking aluminum foil gone I think I ate the aluminum foil that was the t- <laughs> that was the taste because I then um, ate in the center where it didn't stick, and they were fucking delicious. So I don't know what the point of that story was. Just be careful, people. If you're out there baking during this fucking uh, pandemic, if you have the cheap shit aluminum foil, which was all that was left uh, where I went, um, just watch out. Because that that stuff, you eat aluminum foil, it stays with you for a few days. Um. Oh, by the way, here's something that I'm going to attempt. And I want to thank all you guys for listening to my podcast over the years because I'm going to fuck with electricity in my house. Oh, Jesus. There's just a couple of outlets. 
you know, about three or four where one of the outlets works and the other one, if you go to stick it in, like it's like a baby when it doesn't like what you're giving and just sort of just lets it dribble back down its chin. doesn't like what it's eating, you know? That's what it just sort of spits the plug out. So I need some new outlets. And I watched this YouTube video of a guy replacing them. It looks really easy. Um, I'm just terrified of electricity. But for, fortunately, um, our fuse box, everything is labeled correctly. And uh, I know all you do is just you just plug a lamp into the outlet. You turn it on. It's good. And then you throw the switch. And if you come, the fucking thing's off. It doesn't work. You know you're good. So I'm going to be uh, attempting that. And I'm just going to do one. If I get that, then I'll be good. And um, I watched a bunch of videos, and I'm aware to not when you go to put the wire back in, if it's the one where you got to wrap it around, make sure there's no insulation in there. And then also make sure that you don't take away too much insulation where there's bare wire beyond where it would wrap around. Uh, you want the insulation to be f- go right up to where um, the nut is with, that you wrap it around and screw it back in. So I understand all of that shit. And uh, I'm going to give it a shot. Fuck it. Oh, Billy, fix it. Um, All right. Helix, everybody. Some advertising here. Helix. Helix. Um, Oh, this is where they wrote this copy for me. I'm pretty one of a kind, right? I'm unique. I like to think I'm special. Well, Helix Sleep makes mattresses made for unique, for how unique we all are and how we all sleep differently. Uh, not being able to sleep because of today's politics, your love life, any other drama you talk about in your show. Oh, I guess I was supposed to talk about that. Sleeping on, uh, how about the fact I'm having a kid any friggin' day and I'm going to be 52 years old, you know, and I'm wondering if I'm going to, you know, stay alive here long enough. Uh, sleeping on a terrible mattress in before Helix slash on the road. What, is this like just suggestions for me to improv? Your content, putting people to sleep. Any other funny stereotypes slash antidotes slash thoughts that fit your content. Oh, this is like direction. Can I start this over again? Let's go back to one. Okay, I've done a couple of movies. Here we go. Helix. Helix. You know, people, I'm pretty one of a kind, right? I'm unique. Well, Helix Sleep makes mattresses made for how unique we all are and how we all sleep differently. You know, I haven't been able to sleep because of uh, my uh, rotator cup. (laughs) Boy, oh boy, I would love a mattress. Helix Sleep makes personalized mattresses made right here in America. Yeah! And ships straight to your door with free, no contact delivery, free returns, gross, and a hundred night sleep trial. Go gross! Uh, To choose a mattress... Uh, Helix made a quiz that takes just two minutes to complete and matches your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress for you. If you like a mattress that, that's really soft or firm, you sleep on your side or your back or your stomach, or you sleep really hot with Helix, there's a specific mattress for each and every unique taste. Uh, I love Helix, but you don't need to take my word for it. Helix was awarded the number one best overall mattress pick of 2020 by GQ Magazine, Wired Magazine, and Apartment Therapy. Just go to helixsleep.com slash bird, take their two-minute sleep quiz, and they'll match you to a customized mattress that will give you the best sleep of your life. They have a 10-year warranty, and you get to try it out for 100 nights risk-free. They'll even pick it up and give you a full refund if you don't love it, but you will. You know what that reminds me of? I was, I was, my wife was watching my 600-pound life last night. And there was this big fat guy who weighed over 600 pounds, and the doctor comes in, he says, Hey, buddy, if you don't drop some weight, we can't do the fucking bypass uh, stomach fucking shrinkage thing to you. And he's like, okay, but I need my pain meds. I'm in a lot of pain. The guy's like, I'm not giving you any pain. You're in pain because you're overweight, all right? Lay off the pizzas. So what does this guy do? He fucking eats a bunch of pizzas. He gains fucking 80 pounds, which is putting on like five pounds at that, that weight. He gains 80 fucking pounds and also pulls out all of his fucking hair on the top of his head, one strand at a time. So the guy comes back to check on him. He's now 685 pounds, and he looks like fucking Ben Franklin at 28, you know? You know, because he still had black hair. and had a great fucking head of hair. It killed me watching him pull all of that out, you know? 
And uh, he was just really a manipulated guy, manipulating type of a personality. And uh, I was really having a reaction to it. You know, Nia was trying to watch. I was like, they should just let this guy die. I mean, what the what what is he doing? You know, fuck it. What are you keeping him around for? I you know, I swear to God, you know, I might this might be a little Trump, but if I was running, I would just put that guy in a giant hammock and I just take him out to sea and then that's it. You just leave him there and you let all the fucking killer whales. <laughs> that's, that's so fucking mean. I'm sorry. I mean he was though. He was like human sushi. Um Anyway, let's get back to the advertising here. Hymns, everybody. What a common issue men face. Well, okay, what, what's a common issue men face but don't always want to talk about? Think long and hard. Do you get it? 40% of men by age 40 struggle with not being able to get and maintain an erection. Uh, look at me. I'm doing all right then, huh? Why do guys turn to weird solutions or do nothing? when they can turn instead to medicine and science. Um, Expensive pills, injection, where no man wants an injection. Share any experiences you've had with doctors in dealing with ED issues. Is somebody actually going to do that? Um, HIMSS connects you with real licensed doctors and FDA-approved pharmaceutical products to treat ED, well-known Generic equivalents to name brand prescriptions to help you combat ED. Prescription solutions backed by science and made affordable. Answer questions about your medical history and chat with the doctor for a confidential review. If approved by doctor, products are shipped directly to your door. This is going to be the hardest year of your life. You know what's funny is the fact that if you do have this problem that you really can't talk about it. And I'm just sitting there going like, if I had this problem, why the fuck would I want to deal? Why would I want to talk about it? You know, this is a stereotype. Guys should be able to talk about this stuff. Uh, but until you can, uh, hymns, you can talk about it confidentially. Uh, well-known gen- uh, generic equivalents to name brand prescriptions to help you combat your ED. Uh, prescription solutions backed by science and made more affordable. Answer questions about your medical history and chat with the doctor for confidential review. If approved by the doctor, products are shipped directly to your door. This is going to be the hardest year of your life. Sorry, I already read that. Uh, try hymns today by starting out with a free online visit. Go to forhims.com slash burr ed. That's F O R H I M S dot com slash B U R R capital E D. Forhims.com slash burr ed. Prescription products are subject to doctor approval and require online con- consultation with a physician who will determine if a prescription is appropriate. See the website for full details and safety information. This could cost hundreds if you went in person to the doctor's office or pharmacy. Remember, that's for hymns.com slash burr ed. Um, all right. Should we get into some of the reads here for the week? Uh, this is one that I just found today. Uh, it says, hi, Bill. Fuck you. So right there, I'm in. Um, I've got something that may interest you, you, gin- you ginger cunt. Uh, I'm a British, I'm British and a big football fan, not soccer. Fuck you. It's called football. And that's already two reasons to hate me. I'm a, I say I'm a big football fan. In fact, I'm also a fat fuck. That's three reasons. Anyway, I have an interesting baseball story that you might not know. If you do, then fuck you. In fact, I'm too locked down drunk to be able to give the details in coherent enough fashion for your fat ginger, your fat finger reading skills to manage. Just look up Gary Thomason, the ex-Dodger and Yankee player who went to Japan. His name has become a byword for something pointless but beautifully maintained. Look it up. It's fucking interesting. I'm going to bed now. Cheers. Fat fuck so-and-so. Uh, P.S. I love your show. All right. So I looked this up. Um, where the hell is it? The unfortunate legacy of Gary Thomason. And he was right. He was a guy that played in the uh, MLB, he played for the Dodgers and the Yankees. And then he signed a big contract in Japan. Here is his story. Gary Thomason was an American baseball player who lost his mojo when he moved to Japan. But despite his less than stellar career, his name still lives on today. Thanks to Japanese artist, I hope I say, I'm not going to say this right, 
Akas, Akasegawa Genpai. It's a killer name, whatever. Agasegawa. Genpai. Uh, Thomason has become an eponym. I don't know how to say that word. Oh, Jesus Christ. I need to get smarter if I'm going to be fucking talking to people. Eponym. I've spelt it wrong. Let's see, pronunciation. How do you, oh, fuck you with the fucking goddamn fucking windows. Have I ever said yes to any of that? When are you going to quit? Pronunciation, how do you say it? How do you, oh, wait, I had the sound off. All right, here we go. Let's try it again. Let's try it again. Eponym. 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 I never would have guessed that. All right. His name has become an eponym. For a truly bizarre type of architecture, what the fuck just happened? It just scrolled without me. His name has become an eponym for a truly bizarre type of architecture. Objects that are completely useless but still carefully maintained. If you've ever lived in a major city, you've probably seen your fair share of architectural oddities. Perhaps you've spotted a handrail where there aren't any stairs or a door that opens to a brick wall. Maybe you've noticed vents with nothing to ventilate or a section of a fence you can easily walk around. Picture, pictured above, you can see a skyway that no longer connects to anything, uh, yet wasn't demolished and it, with its connected building for some reason. Well, that's probably because they would have charged more money, I would think, to take that fucking thing down. The other buildings, like, we're not, we're not paying for it. And they were like, well, fuck it, then we're just going to leave it. I'm guessing. I have no idea. All right, the whole bushel here. Here we go. If you've ever lived in a major city, I read all of that. Ba, 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 ba. Anyway, uh, there are, these are some remnants of expanding cities. Why the fuck? Oh, because it keeps loading advertising. It keeps moving on me here. Um, these are remnants of expanding cities, but what's confusing is many of these ridiculous doors and pointless pipes are still carefully maintained. While they serve no purpose, they're repainted when they grow rusty or repaired when they fall apart. They also have their own name. They're called Thomasons. So who nicknamed these silly structures and why? Well, the culprit is a Japanese artist named Agasagawa Genpai. Uh, One day in 1972, he was on his lunch break in Tokyo when something caught his eye. That's on my bucket list to go there, by the way. Uh, It was a staircase that went up and down like all staircases do, only there was no door at the top. They were stairs to nowhere. But what really amazed Agasagawa, uh, Agasigawa, was the railing. It was obviously it was obvious that at one time or another, the railing had come apart. But what blew Agasaga was mine was someone had fixed the darn thing. Now the railing was good as new, even though there was no reason why anyone would ever use those stairs. Mystified, Agasawa searched the city for more worthless wonders. Whenever he found an out-of-place pole or a gate in the middle of nowhere, he'd snap a photo. He considered these doors and stairs artistic byproducts of the city. I'm going to give you this guy's name so you can look up his work. It's A-K, I'll spell it, A-K-A. A-K-A-S-E-G-A-W-A. Um, I can't imagine there's somebody else. Maybe that name is like Mike over there. So I'll give you his last fucking name here. Um, Genpai, G-E-N-P-E-I. If you want to look up his work as I continue to read here. Um, one day, 1972, let's see. Blah, blah, blah. It was obvious that at one time or another, I read that. Oh, so he considered them artistic byproducts of the city, and soon he was publish, publishing the pictures in a, in a photography magazine complete with little articles on the, na- the nature of their existence. That's a great book. Um, coffee table book. Um, he also created a name for these vest, vestigial structures. I don't know how to say that word. Fuck, I'm getting killed here today. Okay, let's look this one up. Vestigial pronunciation. Here we go. Here we go. Vestigial. Vestigial. Oh, man, you got to work that into your fucking... Well, you can't really go to a party. I I already forgot how to say it. Vestigial. Vestigial. I like that one. I'm getting sick and tired of this vestigial shit. 
Um, so in order, does that even make sense? So in, in order to be a Thomason, an object must be cared for even though it's completely pointless. Wait, I skipped over a bunch of shit. God damn it. He called them Thomasons after baseball player Gary Thomason, who was played for who played for teams like the Dodgers and the Yankees. While Thomason was a fine player in the States, things changed dramatically when he signed on with the Yomiuri Giants, a team based in Tokyo. Once Thomason arrived in the land of the rising sun, he couldn't hit a ball to save his life. I bet what happened was he got in his head and then he compiled it with the fact that he was this American representing an entire country and the pressure just got too big. Um, where are we here? Um, but, 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 but he couldn't hit a ball to save his life. People called him the giant human fan because all he was doing, because that was all he was doing with the bat was stirring up air. You see that? Baseball, uh, sports fans are sports fans around the world. After Thomason set the all-time Japanese strikeout record in 1981, the coaches benched the poor guy, and that's how Thomason served out the rest of his contract, sitting in the dugout and making money for doing nothing. According to Agasagua, Agasagua, who's who's a huge baseball fan, Thomason had a fully formed body yet served no purpose to the world. Fuck! Oh, my God. But just like those fences and banisters he found around Tokyo, the man was still being maintained. Wow. Wow. Uh, So in order to be a Thomason, an object must be cared for even though it's completely pointless. The concept caught on and soon people were submitting their own Thomasons to Agasegawa's for approval. Agasegawa for approval. In 1985, the artist published his findings in a book called Hyper Art Thomason, which was translated into English in 2009. Oh, my God. This is like international Bill Buckner. The book inspired a new group of Thomason hunters, particularly in, particularly in San Francisco. And Agasegawa's publishers even started a website where they could submit their artistic discoveries. Unfortunately, Gary Thomason's family isn't exactly pleased with the way the ball player is being portrayed. After all, who wants to be remembered for being useless? Of course, as a radio host, Roman Mars points out, how many other ball players from the 70s and 80s can you remember? Thanks to Agasegawa, a bunch. A bunch. I can name half of the fucking big red machine. I can name all the Yankees and the Red Sox. You don't believe me? Here we go. All right. Uh, Dave Concepcion, George Foster, Pete Rose, Tom Seymour, Johnny Bench, Sparky Lyle, Tony Pena. Was Cesar Geronimo on that name? What a fucking name. Was he on that team? Jose Cruz, J.R. Richards. Those are some Astros for you. The fucking Dodgers, Ron Say, Bill Russell, uh, Davey Lopes, Steve Garvey, Steve Yeager, Dusty Baker, Tommy Lasorda. Don't fucking challenge. I can never remember if it was Greg or Craig Nettles. Bucky Dent. Um, Chris Shambliss. Who the fuck was their second baseman? Bucky Dent was short, right? Thurman Munson, rest his soul. Reggie Jackson, Lou Pinella. Ron Guidry, Louisiana Lightning. Jim Rice, Fred Lynn, Carl Yastrzemski. What the fuck are you talking about? It's a dumb point. Um, thanks to Agasega was Gary Thompson's name will live on wherever people find doorknobs attached to brick walls or roads that lead smack dab into dead ends. Well, now I, I got to look that up. I'll look it up after the podcast. So there you go. Thank you. Look at that. You get a drunk fucking British guy. Guy just ate up 15 minutes of the podcast. God bless you. All right. Milwaukee. Hi, Bill. I'm a lady listener. Hey. Welcome, welcome. I love when the ladies write in. I'm a lady listener from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I was wondering what your take is on the Democratic National Convention, which is supposed to be in Milwaukee in August. Do you think it will still happen? What do you think needs to happen at the convention to get people excited about Biden? Uh, Jesus Christ. I mean, Joe Biden making you exciting is excited. It'd be like having somebody tone deaf sing a fucking song on uh, 
you know, in the right key. It's just not going to happen. Hope you have a chance to visit in the summertime. So do I. It is beautiful here right now. I love Milwaukee. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm at this point. I'm rooting. Can you root for other Republicans, too? Can a Republican fucking take the spot? We can just start over again? I don't know. I don't know. This is just a weird, weird-ass fucking transitional time here in politics. Um, all right. Doctor's salaries. By the way, somebody recently, I did a, a Reddit Ask Me Anything, and people asked me about uh, overrated and underrated cities. And I said overrated was a lot of the major cities because uh, a lot of it had to do because I had been to them so many times. But uh, just the traffic, congestion, and all of that shit, how much they cost. You know, the money you got to spend and all of that shit, no place to park. And um, I was naming my, like, top three underrated. Um, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Chattanooga, Tennessee, Knoxville, also honorable mention. Uh, big fan of Tennessee. And uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma are some of the ones that I went to that are fucking amazing. Overrated. Are, and these are all great cities. They just, too many people move to them. Austin, Texas, too many fucking people. Um, I mean, it's just an absolute fucking shit show. Trying to get from the airport to get, trying to get to the airport into Austin to your hotel is, it's like if you've ever landed in Washington, Dulles Airport, and then, you know, especially if you're coming from the West Coast, you land right at rush hour. I mean, it's like fucking two hours just to get to your fucking hotel. Um, that's why I, I always try to fly into Reagan. Fly right in there, jump in a cab, boom, you're there. It costs more, but I don't give a fuck. Um, I'm kind of into the... Uh, the same way I'm into smaller cities, I'm into smaller airports. I like doing that, and I don't give a fuck if I have to pay more money. I just like that way better than dealing with uh, the bigger... The bigger ones I liked going to when I was a younger man, but now that I'm an older man and I don't want to fucking deal with lugging my luggage and all of that shit, and they have wheels. My luggage has wheels like everybody else, all right? And I'm still talking about lugging it. That's how fucking old I am. All right, Dr. Salaries, everybody. Dear Bodacious Billington... Billington. Can I come watch it? Uh, My daughter has a virtual... Virtual uh, dance recital. Hang on a second. I gotta. I'll be right back. Uh, what's up? Uh, you need to watch me. What are you gonna go do? No. All right. Hang on. I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm coming. All right. I'll hang on a second, guys. All right. I just crushed the parent daughter dance. Killed it. You know. Some moves that have never been seen before. Oh, Jesus. Um, all right, I'm back. All right, Dr. Salaries. Dear Bodacious Billing Team, uh, that intro was what Gmail suggested to me when I typed Bill. That's artificial intelligence for you. Uh, love the podcast. Okay. Some orthopedic surgeons and plastic surgeons make over $750,000 a year while... Many general medicine doctors and pediatricians make under $225,000 a year. The highest paid surgeons are clearly overpaid. Um, And what, as compared to the other ones? Dude, somebody's operating on your face. I mean, how do you you put a price on that? I don't think I would want to bargain bin shopping for that. I don't know. Uh, But... Do you think general medicine doctors like your primary care doctor or your daughter's pediatrician and their peers are, peers are underpaid? Well, this next point is what I was going to bring up. They often leave medical school with 200000 to $300,000 in debt. Physicians often work 60 plus hours a week with 10 to 20 of those hours being spent doing paperwork and dealing with bullshit pharmaceutical and insurance companies. We need more doctors and with those salaries versus debts, we won't get them. Do you think we should pay doctors, not surgeons, more? Or do you think that even with that debt, they should be happy with what they have? Um, oh, I imagine like with any business, the people that employ them are keeping the lion's share of the money. And they probably um, exploit people like it's kind of. 
I mean, capitalism gets a bad rap. I mean, I just kind of see people getting exploited in every country that I fucking go to. So uh, it, I think it's a human thing, not really a form of government thing. But um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think out of everybody out there, as far as like earning a living, earning the money that you're, you're being paid, the fact that these people help you prevent you from dying, I don't know how you put a price on that. That's really the most important thing out there is staying alive. And um, as far as like uh, orthopedic surgeons, I mean, yeah, your quality of life is so much more improved. Those are the people that give you like, you know, hip replacements, knee replacements. You can actually walk around, right? Fuck, I got to look that up. Orthopedic. I get all of those confused, except for gynecology, just because there's been so many jokes about it. I know podiatrists too. That's just because I'm old. Orth. The pedic surgeon spelt it wrong. Uh, orthopedic surgeon. Oh, for fuck's sakes. Now they're just giving me a bunch of fucking orthopedic surgeons' names. All right, Wikipedia. Is the branch of surgery concerned with involving the musculoskeletal system? By the way, let me see. Who's the first guy that comes up? Oh, it's people in your neighborhood. I was like, who's like the fucking Kevin Hart, you know, like the biggest or Sebastian, like the biggest, the Dave Chappelle of uh, uh, orthopedic surgeons that if you Google them, like their name just comes up. That's fucking interesting. Uh, we need more doctors and they'll say, okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't have a problem giving them more money. I mean, I don't pay them. I, I imagine there's somebody that the guy who owns the hospital, the team owner. Um. That's actually kind of fascinating. Uh, but then as far as like plastic surgeons, um, you know, everybody thinks it's somebody getting tits or fucking fake asses or something like that. But, you know, there's also people that, you know, get into car accidents and stuff like that. And these people, you know, get, you know, lacerations to the face. You did such a great job, buddy. Yes, I did. You did. <laughs> did you have fun in the dance class? Yeah. How did, did daddy dance okay? Yes. I'm making a very, what you do when you interview a kid, you don't ask yes or no questions. You got to ask, how did you feel about dance class? What is it that you like about dance class? I like about mommy go poopy. You like it that mommy goes poopy? She's she's potty trained now, so she's all about poop. But, yeah. Okay, that's your statement on dance class, is that mommy goes poopy? Yeah. Okay. Is there anything else you would like to add? Because I got to get back to the podcast. Yes. Um, I like to play Candyland Shoots and Ladders. You like to play Candyland Shoots and Ladders. What about those walkie-talkies? Yes, (laughs) walkie-talkies. All right, are we going to play when I'm done here? Um, no. No? (laughs) Come on, buddy. We're going to go play wiffle ball. Okay? T-ball. T-ball, yeah, T-ball. Sorry. 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 Well, I'm old, so I use different references. Um, and then we can play catch. No. All right, come on. Let me let me knock this out, and then we'll go play. All right. Hey, great job, buddy. Got it. You got it. All right. Um, close the door, buddy. Hey. Thank you. Um. All right. Where was I? Okay. Advice. Email. Popping boners at work. Well, here's a guy who doesn't eat for hymns. I'm a 21-year-old male from, I'm not going to say where, who moved to Washington for a decent education. Um, all right. The state he's from is also the last name of one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time. <laughs> and that state isn't known for its education. And my family wanted me to have a chance in today's world. Anyway, I recently got a job at a grocery store so I can make some cash on the side and take advantage of an increased need of healthy people willing to work during a pandemic. Here's the problem. 99% of the women in this state dress like they just ran the Boston Marathon. They wear yoga pants that show off their hips or loose shirts that show a lot of cleavage. Maybe I'm just an ignorant male, but in the state of blah, 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 most people, most People, women included, wear pants or cargo shorts 
that aren't flaunting their bodies 24-7. I'm having a difficult time not having hard-ons during my shift hours. I'm not claiming to have a magnum dong, but when I look down, you can clearly see I'm aroused since I tuck my shirt in and wear a belt like a gentleman. (laughs) If knee is there, I'm sure it'll end up being my fault. Oh, shit, shots fired. But I swear I'm not drooling over these women. It's just hard, pun included, intended, I think you meant, to not notice their mostly beautiful bodies, especially when they flaunt it so casually. It's kind of like if a lady has really colorful hair or an, or if an attractive 30-plus-year-old lady wears white yoga pants with a black thong. It's something your, your eyes, brain, and dung would want to look at. Any advice would be appreciated. Go fuck yourself. Uh, my advice is hang in there, buddy. Hang in there. All right? You got two positive going for yourself. One, your dick works. There's people out there, they got to take for hymns. You're all right. Okay? So you're fine. And then secondly, you know, I imagine if you got a job at a titty bar the first couple of days, you'd be like, God damn, look at all these fucking titties. And then after a while, it's just titties. I think you'll get used to it, and I think you'll be fine. As long as you don't start rubbing your dick you know, with your hand or up against whatever fucking, I don't know, their food or some shit, you should be fine. Um, you know, but yeah, what are you supposed to do? If they're coming in there with wearing their fucking, I mean, listen, I've been out here in LA forever and I still almost hit a tree every time I drive down the street. Some of the, the lack of clothing that the women wear out here, God bless them. I'm not complaining. All right. Hey, hy- hypoth- she's not wearing it for you. She's wearing it for her fucking comfort. Oh, really? Listen, I've watched enough fucking baseball to know when the catcher's framing the fucking strike zone to make a ball look like a strike. So get the fuck out of here with that bullshit. Um, Hypothetical dilemma. Bill, I got one for you. Uh, You're you, but you're not famous for comedy. Okay, oh, it's a dilemma. Okay, you're you, but you're not famous for comedy. You're just a hardware store employee in Boston. A member of British royalty falls in love with you. It doesn't even matter if you love her back. Maybe you do. The question is, could you keep your mouth shut and eat your cake and have it too? Oh, would I marry her? No, I couldn't do it. Could you marry into that and be responsible for acting as the palace required? No, I would feel like a fucking loser. Uh, Remember, you might get all sorts of cool luxuries, but have to attend lots of events, though. Keep in mind that life in a one-bedroom in Medford might not be that bad. No, I I couldn't do that. If I loved her, I would do it. But even then, I would just be, I would be constantly saying, hey, you don't need to buy me anything. Can I at least pay for the cable in the palace? Can I do something? Can I wash the royal dishes? I have to do something to earn my keep. I'm not going to sit here because if I really honestly don't have to do anything other than go to these, I'll tell you what I would do is I would become a fucking drunk. I would become a fucking drunk. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I just got a fucking message from my fucking agent. Um, postponed postponed. Oh, no. Oh, Jesus Christ. I was hoping that's about moving a fucking date. God damn it. You know, you start to get excited. Um, all right, let's, let's, let's wrap up the podcast here. All right, great songs, not the hits. This, we're going deep cuts. I don't know why we haven't done this before. I love this shit. All right, this guy says, or this lady says, um, wait, did I answer this thing? Yeah, I, I, I couldn't... I couldn't do that. I would have to keep working in the fucking hardware store, but then you have a level of fame and then you have security around you. It would, it would, I wouldn't want to be famous for being with somebody who's famous. That's not how I'm fucking wired. And I got to tell you, from what I heard, Medford's really fucking nice now, you know? Uh, Great songs, not the hits. Plus, you know, then I'd have to move to England and I wouldn't get to watch all my fucking teams. I couldn't go to games. That's the one thing that I, I, that the only thing that sucks about being in this fucking business is I really wish that, uh, 
you know, I could live in Massachusetts again, you know, and just go to a fucking Red Sox game, Bruins, Celtics, Patriots. I really wish I could do that. That's fucking hilarious if I ended up doing that and I missed the entire championship fucking two decades I was away. Although it was fun to be behind enemy lines while all of that was happening too. Um, Anyway, all right, here we go. Deep cuts here. Great songs, not the hits. So if you guys haven't heard this premise, this is basically like, you know, anybody who listens to ACDC on the radio, they know you shook me all night long. They might not know what's next to the moon, get it hot. So this is people letting you know about the deeper cuts, stuff like that. All right, great songs, not the hits. Now, I love everything by Steely Dan, but I feel the track uh, doesn't get nearly enough credit for the song is Don't Take Me Alive, which is much more rock than their traditional sound. Um, My wife's a big Steely Dan fan. I don't know their songs by name. I did see them in concert, and they were fucking great. Uh, The Cult. Most people either know them for Firewoman from 1989's Sonic Temple or She Sells Sanctuary from 1985's Love. However, 1987's Electric Album produced by Rick Rubin, has some killer tracks, including Electric Ocean, Bad Fun, and Love Removal Machine. Keep up the great work. Now, I got to look. Now, am I crazy? Was was Matt Sorum the drummer in that band? Let me see here. I, I got to look this up. Doggone it. I got to get to the bottom of this. Now, why won't this fucking thing open up? Where did it go? Where the fuck is it? Oh, it's all the way down here. All right. The cult. The cult. Matt Sorum. He's best known as a member of the rock band Guns N' Roses, with whom he recorded three studio and a member of the supergroup Velvet Revolver. Fucking love that band. I saw them at the uh, the Wiltern. Uh, Sorum is currently a member of the touring project Kings of Chaos and is formerly a uh, member of the cult. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. When... He's 59. He looks fucking great. Um, 60 to 89. When was he in the cult? Years active. Come on. I wish they would do this. You know, they do that with teams. Like you played for the Patriots from this to this. Um, I'll have to look at this later because I'm, I'm getting bumping up against here on time. I will show you something that's fucking amazing. Is underrated. I'll give you an underrated. Overrated, underrated. As far as New England Patriot coaches... Chuck Fairbanks. Look at this shit. Patriots number one draft picks. You should see this guy's draft that he had in 73. You know, if Chuck Knoll didn't do it, he did. I would say that uh, Chuck Fairbanks, Patriots number one draft picks. There we go. Oh, fuck you. Well, I, it's not going to come up for me, of course, because I'm doing the podcast. I'll read these to you at some point. But one, one year, the, they, it was like uh, John Hanna, Sam Cunningham, Daryl Stingley. And then the next year, we had like Mike Haynes, Stanley Morgan, uh, Raymond Claiborne. They were incredible, incredible teams. That, By the way, that 76 team was uh, – one roughing the passer fucking call away from going to the fucking Super Bowl. Uh, they got beat on that call, but that was a great team. That 76 Raiders team was a great fucking team. Um, but we went we went toe-to-toe with them, and we're actually going to win the fucking game in their goddamn, uh, their own fucking stadium. Well, they actually shared it with the A's, whatever. Their fucking two-bedroom apartment that they had with the Oakland A's. And we were actually going to win that fucking game. And then it was a very highly, highly, highly questionable fucking roughing the passer call. Um, you know, and for all Al Davis bitching that the NFL was against him, I, there's no fucking way he bitched after that call, at least for a week. All right, Billy Joel, uh, River of Dreams. You've heard the track, the title track on the album. The sleeper songs are Great Wall of China, a song about his old manager fucking him. Oh, that's right, because he got fucked out of money, right? And I thought it was his brother-in-law. And Famous Last Words, the last song on the album and the last song with lyrics he has released. Okay. Um, that's another bucket list thing, too. I got to see him in concert. He always plays fucking Madison Square Garden, and I'm out here. I got to see that guy in concert. I saw him one time. You ever see him on Howard Stern? It's like fucking 8 o'clock in the morning. He's absolutely crushing it. 
Just hearing him just play piano, how good he is. Fucking amazing. All right, Two Live Crew has some great tracks. Yeah, I know. We have all heard the classics. Uh, we want some pussy. <laughs> you know, I've never really listened to them. Uh, but don't underestimate Throw the D. The intricate drum beat combined with the melody allows for some smooth lyrics to relax your brain. I really enjoy listening to this track before I go to bed. Throw the D. I got to listen to this. I'll, I'll tell you, underrated drum track um, is uh, Run DMC, My Adidas. If you want to play along to something, that's fucking amazing to play if you play drums. Throw the D. Uh, you know what came up? Throw, throw the damn towel. Uh, two live crew. All right, let's listen to this thing for a second. I might download this immediately. Just the title alone is hilarious. Oh, Jesus. An ultrasonic toothbrush, everybody. Just in case. Oh, well, exactly what I don't need. Wait a minute. What is this thing? Oh, this is for... You started seeing patients ruin their teeth with an ordinary brush and decided to partner with the product engineer to create Dr. Matt Spiker and Mark Kroller. This music is so compelling. Can you believe it's about a toothbrush? All right, here we go. Listen up, y'all, because this is it. Forget that old dance, and Okay. Um, <laughs> I'll have to give that a, a, a better listen. But I have to tell you, I enjoyed the music and the toothbrush thing a little better. Uh, I know it's a classic. I know it's a classic, so I will go back and listen to it. Uh, the Cult of Rick Rubin. I got to listen to that fucking thing. Okay, that's it, everybody. That's the podcast, everyone. Um, that's it. Don't riot. Don't fucking go after mom and pop stores. Please don't do that shit. Please keep it focused on what it should be about, okay? Can we, can we try to do that for once? George Floyd, let's keep his name out there and all of that stuff. And everybody just sit down and fucking work it out and the world becomes a better place. You know, let's go positive here. No one wants to listen to your fucking, your goddamn, like, inflammatory shit. Let's, let's bring people together. Can we do that? Can we do that? Uh, that's it. All right. I'm predicting it right now. The Denver, uh, the fucking presidential election. I'm calling it right now. The dud versus the dope on pay-per-view. Who knows? Maybe, 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 what's his face? Maybe, 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 uh, uh, what's his name? Joe Biden. Who knows? Maybe he has some sort of fucking left hook in him. That's just going to catch the current champ on the jaw. Who knows? Who knows? I don't know. I've always found all of those, those presidential debates to just be, uh, just unwatchable. Just politicians just have this unique, like outside their own body sort of vibe. And I just think it's, it's because of the pressure that they're underneath. You know what I mean? Like that guy who went to Japan and couldn't hit anymore. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I think I want to watch it. Why am I still talking? All right. I have shit to do. All right. God bless all of you. Go fuck yourselves. And I'll check in on you on Thursday.